Okay, so I think uh, I think we'll get started. There's still a few folks kind of uh, gathering, but we should we should get underway. I would encourage everybody if you haven't had a seat yet. There's lots and lots of seats. There's seats in the middle, uh, so please try to find a seat because there may be other folks coming a little later. So I want to welcome you to uh, this event to release the 2011 uh, version of the Atlantic Century Report that ITIF, with uh, the help of uh, the European American Business Council, uh, released two years ago and now are updating that. Uh, I'm Rob Atkinson. I'm uh, president of ITIF and the co-author and my other co-author, Scott Andy. Scott, do you want to just stand? Scott is the person who actually did all of the work. I just get the credit. Uh, Scott did all the data analysis on this report, which was quite voluminous. So um, I think most of you know when we released this report two years ago, January, I believe, we looked at how the U.S. was faring on innovation-based competitiveness relative to Europe, uh, a number of countries in Asia, and some countries in Latin America. And when Scott gave me the spreadsheet before we published the report, it was my first look at it to see how we were doing. One of the things that we wanted to do in the report was not just look at where we are today, but how we had progressed over the last decade. And when he shared that spreadsheet with me, uh, my jaw dropped because lo and behold, we were 40th out of 40 countries. We had made less progress than any other country in this uh, group of countries, including countries in Europe, as I said, Asia, and, uh, and the Americas. So we're, uh, that got a lot of play. Um, Tom Friedman wrote about that. Anish Chopra has talked about it. Uh, the CEO of Eli Lilly, the CEO of Intel, a number of others, because it's such a striking and, and in many ways scary fact. Uh, so we wanted to update the report now two years later, although I'll have to say, given government data sources, uh, this isn't about data from certainly not this year. Some of the data are 2010. Some of it goes back to 2009, but it's still more updated data. So we have, what I'm going to do is we will, um, I'm going to present some of the results and we'll have some, our panelists uh, talk about this. Let me just introduce um, our panelists going down the line here. Mike Maybach is the president and CEO of the European American Business Council, which is, uh, has, is a organization of member companies of 75 European and North American based global enterprises. Uh, Mike has a long background in, uh, in this area of public service. Uh, he was actually the youngest, uh, first American elected under the age of 21 years. Uh, I didn't know that. That must have been... 1870s. I was going to say, that was a long time ago in uh, DeKalb uh, County. He uh, got his master's degree at Northwestern University. He joined Caterpillar Tractor uh, and, and was the government affairs manager and then um, Moved on to Intel, where he was government. He was a government affairs director for Intel for many years, um, and now uh, with the ABC. But he's had a long background in these issues around international business and U.S. Uh, competitiveness. Uh, Maria uh, Kosmanen is the Minister Council for Economic Affairs, Embassy of Finland, and. Uh, just a slight clue as to a country that might do really, really well in the index from who's on our panel, but I'm not going to give that away yet. <laughs> she has worked for the Finnish Foreign Service for 20 years, uh, started in 1991, uh, has had postings in many different parts of the world, including, including Tokyo and then the delegation in Geneva, um, and uh, has a, a master's degree uh, from the University of Helsinki. Uh, my friend and colleague Kent Hughes uh, is the director of the program on America and the global economy at the Woodrow Wilson Center here in Washington. Uh, he, this is a program uh, that looks at competitiveness and technology and innovation in the U.S. Prior to that, he was the associate director of Sec associate deputy secretary of commerce from '93 to '99. He was also the second head of the Council on Competitiveness. For those of you who remember back in the good old days, uh, or the old days, when the Council on Commerce was first formed, Kent was the second head of that, uh, was also a senior economist to the JEC, uh, and also the author of a really fine book, if you haven't read it, called Building the Next American Century, The Past and Future of Economic Competitiveness. And finally, uh, Lenny Mendoza, who is the Director of Knowledge Development at McKinsey Global Institute. I don't know whether I should be envious of McKinsey or feel honored that they're doing similar work, but I always, whenever I read a Lenny report, I'm like, wow, this is great. This is such good stuff. So it's just a real 
pleasure to see McKinsey doing the, the really amount and quality work they're doing on these critical issues around competitiveness. So if you haven't seen the McKinsey Global Institute work on these issues, I really recommend that you do so. Uh, he uh, is a director in the San Francisco office uh, where he leads the firm's knowledge development. Uh, he's also on the shareholder council of McKinsey, board of directors, uh, oversees the McKinsey Global Institute and has a long, long background in these questions around economic development, competitiveness, corporate strategy. He received his MBA from the Stanford Business School. So before I, before I start, I just wanted to turn it over to uh, Mike Maybach for some opening remarks. As I said, EABC was, was a, has been a, a generous supporter of making this work possible. And I think you just press that button. Um, it should work. And it does not. Does it work? Nope. No. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and thanks everyone for coming, and Scott, for all the work you put in the report. Uh, delighted you're all here today, and um, I think it's a very important topic. Uh, the background, briefly, is that um, that the European American Business Council is, um, as our mission, focused not on, only on U.S. competitiveness, but Western competitiveness. Uh, one of the reasons that this is important is because with 11% of the world's people, the U.S. and Europe represent over half of the world's GDP, uh, healthcare spending, uh, and all kinds of other metrics. Uh, the European Union countries are the number one investors in the United States. 72% of foreign investment into the U.S. comes from European uh, companies and over half of the foreign investment into Europe comes from U.S. companies. There's more, <clears throat> excuse me, there's more U.S. investment in Ireland than in China, India, Brazil, and Russia combined. There's more Dutch invest investment in Texas than Dutch investment in China, and on and on. So it is a huge investment relationship. For every dollar traded across the Atlantic, four dollars are invested. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> In addition uh, to those uh, economic numbers, the West has a lot of important common commercial and political values, intellectual property and the protection of private property, due process, transparency, democratic institutions, things that we value and we take for granted that not every country and society enjoy. Uh, 2008, Rob and I were talking about U.S. and Western competitiveness and uh, developed this idea of an index that would work, look at these 16 metrics. Uh, they did the 2009 report. It was very well received, and I think it was an important barometer. Everything you measure gets better, we used to say at Intel. Uh, things are, we're measuring them, but things are not getting better in the West, and we're going to be hearing the results of that. So thank you very much, Scott and Rob, for all your work and your staff, and thanks again for all of your, um, all of your attendance here today and the interest in this topic. Great. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> I got this one to work. I'm good. Okay, good. Okay, so <coughs> on to uh, the results. This is the report. Um, and I said that was Atlantic Century One. It was a report that compared innovation based competitiveness in 40 countries and some regions. The regions were the NAFTA region and the EU 15, EU 10, EU 25. Uh, it looked at 16 different indicators. Everything from corporate R&D, government R&D, scientists and engineers, and you'll, you'll see those in, in, in just a minute. I will say one of the problems with doing a report like this is that much of the data, particularly as soon as you go outside the OECD, becomes problematic to get. One way some organizations have dealt with that, like for example the World Economic Forum competitors Index, is to do surveys. Uh, we chose to not rely on survey data because we find that it is quite biased and backward looking. So, for example, on WVF, they list the U.S. as being the most R&D, corporate R&D intensive nation in the world because that's what people think. And so when they do surveys, they ask people, who's doing the most corporate R&D? U.S. Cup is number one. As you'll see in using real data, that's just not the case. We're much lower than that. So we're only using real data. I know that's weird, um, but that's what we're doing. And I pressed the wrong button. Uh oh, that's not good. Catherine, oh, there we go. Okay, that's what I did. All right, sorry. So that was the story that came out in 2009, and that's why it got so much attention. We looked at the rate of growth, put all these 16 variables together, you combine them with standard deviations, and you ask who's made the most progress and who's made the least progress. 
Obviously, seeing China there is not a big surprise. We would all expect China to make rapid progress, partly just because they're starting from a low base. But look at some of these other countries that are starting from a very high base, Japan. I mean, isn't Japan a basket case? Isn't that what we've been hearing? Well, Japan appears to be a basket case because they have so few people being added to their economy uh, because of age and demographic problems, but their underlying economy up until this last crisis was actually doing quite well. Austria, Ireland, Korea, some of these other countries. But we were dead last, as you can see. Now, Atlantic Century 2, we've updated that about two and a half years later. Uh, oh, I should add, we added um, several countries, Argentina, we want to get a little bit better mix. Argentina, Chile, Malaysia, Indonesia, South Africa, and Turkey. Uh, we also took out Luxembourg and Malta uh, because I don't think they're real countries. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> the reason we took them out is that some of their numbers are just very, very strange uh, because of the big financial flows coming in and the banking hubs and all that. They just skewed a lot of the numbers and really didn't. We didn't think we're representative of what was actually going on. So let me start with the results. Uh, I should also add, by the way, we slightly changed the methodology on a few things this year. So when we do that, if we went back, the U.S. would have been fourth, would have been, uh, would have been fifth in, in 2009. Luxembourg was ahead of taking Luxembourg out. We, would have, we were fourth. So essentially, we're unchanged. We're fourth today. Now, you can see the countries that are ahead of us. Uh, Singapore is number one now. Not a surprise if you follow what Singapore is doing. They have an incredibly sophisticated approach to winning the global innovation race. Finland is number two, uh, which is why Marty is here. Again, Finland, uh, they just came out with a new strategy by their technology group called Tekus. Uh, they have a, they're working on a wide variety of fronts to become and, and to be an innovation leader in the world. Sweden, again. Uh, but some of these other countries that you might, you might not expect, uh, South Korea, again, a country that's nowhere near our development levels, maybe 55% of our GDP per capita, doing very, very well. Uh, now, if you look at where the EU is on that, you can see the EU um, 15 is quite far behind us, uh, somewhere kind of closer to the middle of the pack. Now, it looks a little different, though, when you do change scores. Now, the great news is we're no longer the worst. <laughs> we're second worst. <laughs> the bad news is Italy's below us. So if you look at this change score, who's made the most amount of progress of those 44 countries since 1999 to 2011? Now, you got to recognize most of those data points are 2009, 2010, but the year we're publishing in 2011. So <coughs> China, number one, Korea, South Korea, uh, a lot of uh, Eastern European countries, Latvia, Estonia. Uh, but you can see we're still all the way there in the back. So when you look at all of these variables together, how much have we expanded our corporate R&D? How much have we expanded our productivity? How much have we expanded new firm formation? We're second to the worst. Uh, you know, I don't know if beating Italy really counts for anything. Uh, well, no offense, but I mean, Italy has a lot of problems. If you look at the Italian economy now, given where it used to be, Italy is facing the same kind of challenges we're facing today. And there's a big debate in Italy. How do they restructure their economy to become global winners? We need to be having that same debate here. Now, another thing we did is we looked at the change score just in the last two years. Now, again, you got to remember most of that data is probably 07 to 09 in terms of when the data points are from. But the U.S. is doing a little better. Uh, so we're, I think, what's that, about 23rd, 27th on, uh, sorry, it says it right there, 27th, uh, in terms of our overall progress. So that's better than being last. Interesting, though, if you saw the piece today in the Post on Latvia, uh, with the big financial crisis that Latvia has been under, they're dead last and have made almost no progress just in those last few years. But again, interesting countries there, Portugal. Uh, made a lot of progress just in the last few years. Uh, China, no, no, no uh, big surprise there, and some other countries. Now, one of the things we did this year is we looked at. There's an interesting point that people raise, which is, yeah, well, the U.S. is really sort of like uh, uh, Europe in the sense of, you know, no offense to Finland, but if the United, if Europe were a United European states, Finland would be like Massachusetts or Illinois or whatever. They're smaller countries. So we said, well, how would U.S. states do? And we were only were able to get seven of the 14, 16 variables, uh, but we got seven variables, uh, things like uh, productivity, things like how much corporate R&D, 
things like the knowledge capability of the workforce, uh, broadband, some other things. And if these states were their own countries competing in the world, we would have nine U.S. states that would lead any country in the world. So Finland is there as the, as the uh, when you do this metric, by the way, Finland becomes the world leader as a country using these, these seven measures as opposed to the broader 16. But you can see Massachusetts would be the world's leading innovative place. California next, Connecticut, New Jersey, Washington, Delaware, Maryland, Colorado, and um, New Hampshire. Well, that's interesting. Uh, so it suggests that the U.S. still has core strengths, particularly in certain places in the U.S. Now, if you jump in and say, how are we doing on various indicators? This is a measure of the percentage of the college age population. So I think it's 22 to 65 years old uh, with a tertiary degree, with a college degree. And you can see we're nowhere near the top. A country like South Korea, which is uh, almost manic on getting everybody a college degree has, has uh, exceeded us. Canada, again, in the last decade, Canada has made a major effort to expand college enrollment and, and uh, college degrees, and, and you can see that that's paid off. Then if you look at education change, this is the rate of change in college graduates. Again, U.S. Uh, almost, almost at the bottom there, um, although Finland doesn't do very well there. I have to see what that's all about. Uh, but you can see many other countries making making progress there. Oh, that's the same one. Sorry, I shouldn't do that. Let's try this. Oh, that's interesting. Anybody want to see if they know how to use this? All right. Press the back button. There we go. Okay. I will not press that button. <coughs> Okay, so if you look at researchers, uh, what you see again, the U.S. isn't uh, anywhere near that. That's where Finland is. If you look at Finland, they have more scientific researchers. These are scientists and engineers as a share of their workforce. They're almost double where we are. Uh, and again, you can see that we're not doing too poorly, but uh, we, we could be doing better. EU 15, somewhere near, near the front, but not as well. Now, if you look at rate of change, uh, the U.S., again, near the back on that. Uh, you look at a country like China, where they've seen 145% increase in their researchers over the last decade. Uh, U.S. is just 6.4%. Uh, but again, even certain countries that you would think are already mature, uh, U.K., 45% increase, Denmark, 60% increase, Austria, 67% increase. And so these countries that have been scientific powerhouses are still making progress here. Is that U.S. citizens? Researchers? No, or? U.S. residents. So these would be people who live here regardless of their citizenship. Thank you. Okay, business R&D. This is uh, how much companies are investing in research and development as a share of gross domestic product. And what you can see there, U.S. is not number one. Uh, Japan is number one. Finland is number two. South Korea. Uh, part of that is because our R&D tax credit isn't as effective as it used to be. But one of the things I think that's interesting about that is that we see China, for example, now breaking the 1% mark on business R&D. China businesses do more R&D as a share of their economy than Dutch businesses, uh, than Irish businesses, than UK businesses. That's pretty striking when you think about that, how well positioned China is now in this space. Now, if you look at business R&D change, uh, again, we're near the bottom there, uh, just a 0.4% change. Uh, again, you look at some of these other countries, China, very, very high levels. Uh, Chile, huge, huge increases. But again, even countries like Japan, 25% increase in business R&D as a share of GDP. So these countries have been able to uh, get their companies to do more. Government R&D. Uh, we are lagging behind on that. You can see other countries there, Austria, Finland, Singapore, uh, significantly more R&D, some of these countries. Uh, we are, if we had continued our growth of government R&D support from 1957 to 1987, so just take that growth rate and extend it out to 2010, we would be about $180 billion more in government R&D than we're investing today. In other words, we would be we would have to double 
we'd have to triple our level of our government R&D funding to just keep up with that rate. Obviously, we're not going to do that, but that tells you one of the things that's happened there. That's the rate of change. Um, again, you can see on government R&D, the U.S. is actually down. We're negative 1% over the last decade. Uh, other countries making big bets, Spain, uh, Austria. Austria is up 36%. Uh, Korea is up 35%. Uh, Canada is up 8%. Venture capital. You know, this is one I hear all the time about the U.S. We may not be doing so well on certain areas, but we are still the most entrepreneurial country in the world. We're still creating all of these new companies and investing in VC. According to our data, right now the U.S. invests less in venture capital. This is not amount under management. This is the amount actually invested in deals, invested in new start firms and other firms. We are actually investing less than the EU15 in venture funding. Now, who would have expected that 10 years ago? That's a striking, striking result. Uh, and you can see some other countries, just, you know, Finland, twice as much as we do in venture funding. Uh, venture capital change. Now, again, part of that is because it's a little bit near the peak for the U.S., but it was also near the peak for a lot of other countries. Uh, one of the reasons why Japan is so high here is because Japan doesn't do hardly any venture funding, and they've increased it from a small base. But still, we haven't kept up there. Uh, new firms. Again, you hear that same story. New firms. We're, we're doing really well on new firms. But again, uh, many, many other countries uh, create new firms at a much faster rate than we do. You can see the UK, uh, Canada. Now, being from Canada, uh, where my parents are from, I have to tell you, the idea of growing up that Canada would outperform the U.S. in new firms, if you know anything about Canada, uh, that's a big, big surprise. The Canadians are risk averse. They don't like taking big chances yet they create more firms, new firms, than we do. Yeah, I figured that out. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, new firm change. Um, you can see the U.S. again. We're just 2005, 2009, which are the only data we can get that's cross-national like that. We are, we're down. You would expect us, perhaps, to be down because of the recession, but look at some of these other, uh, some of these other countries. Uh, broadband, this is a combined measure of, of quality, which is a measure of speed as well as latency as well as subscription. What's interesting there is there's, a, I think, a pretty common view that our broadband isn't as good as people think it is. We actually have better broadband under this measure than the EU15 do. Uh, we're still behind some countries. The real leaders in the world here are Korea, Japan, Sweden, which have extensive fiber optic networks and advanced cable networks. But still, we're doing, I think, a little bit better than, than what some people think. Uh, let me skip over that. IT investments, sort of doing okay, but again, as a share of our economy, we haven't kept up with other countries. In part, that's about tax policy. Other countries allow these investments to be written off much more, uh, much more quickly. Effective corporate tax rates. We, we always try to do two events a day. We just did one this morning uh, on corporate tax reform, and Pete Merrill was uh, from PricewaterhouseCoopers was there, and one of the points he presented was that there's a mythology out there that it's not just our statutory rate that's high. It's a mythology that our statutory rate is high, 35%, which is very high. It's the second highest in the world. Uh, but that our effective rate is actually not very high. And I think the evidence is quite clear from Pete's work and other groups. And this is World Bank uh, data. We're in the top quartile of any study that we've been able to find on effective corporate tax rates. Uh, there's just a few other countries here. Uh, that are higher. Uh, and the fact that Argentina is higher, by the way, is not a sign of uh, anything we should be proud of. Uh, they really don't like business down there, as far as I can tell. Um, so I think that's a challenge. Uh, ease of doing business. This is a World Bank, part of the World Bank today that's just looking at kind of regulatory burdens, how easy it is to incorporate a business, these sorts of things. Uh, we're doing okay there. Uh, fourth, uh, but in terms of getting worse uh, relative to other countries, we're getting worse on the ease of doing business. Uh, FDI, we're, you know, a part of that, small countries have more FDI, but we're not doing as well there. All right, trade balance. Uh, as a share of GDP, we're not doing very well on trade balance. We have a big, big trade deficit, obviously. Uh, and you can see some of those countries that are, that are you know, not doing very well, France, uh, Finland, uh, Korea. Uh, but I think that's a, that, that's a challenge. Again, if you look at change, we're getting worse on that. All right, and just to finish up, productivity. This is an area where we do quite well. Historically, the U.S. has had high productivity. 
Uh, we're third now behind the Netherlands and Belgium, who, while they don't work as many hours as we do, they get more out of their hours worked, perhaps because they're not as tired as we are. When you look at productivity change, though, there are many, many countries in the last decade that have seen higher productivity growth. China, obviously, uh, but some of these other countries, uh, uh, many of these in East, Eastern Europe, but, but certainly not, not all, have seen uh, higher productivity growth than we have. So, what's, what does this mean? The fact that we're 43rd out of 44 countries. What does it mean we have to do, and what does it mean we're likely to end up with? Well, if you think about... Uh, if you think about what happened to the Rust Belt, uh, we had a whole debate in the 70s and 80s about the U.S. Rust Belt and how it was falling apart, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what happened in the 70s and 80s was the whole country did well because the Southeast and the West did well. The, the Rust Belt, sort of the area from Boston all the way to Milwaukee, did poorly. Uh, well, there were two places that are like prototypical of that era when you study history. One was Buffalo. <coughs> never really recaptured its former glory, it never recaptured its industrial and economic strength, and it's really a struggling metropolitan area to this day. The other is Boston. Boston lost half of its shoe production, lost half of its uh, sort of basic metalworking production in two decades, and yet Boston transformed itself into a really, I would say, one of the high-tech leaders in the world today. And it did it on the basis of higher education, on research, on high-tech companies, on venture funding and the like. So I think the question for the U.S. is, are we going to be follow the Buffalo path, or are we going to follow the Boston path? I think the same thing for Europe. Uh, we're going to follow the Rome path, essentially Italy, that did well, but hasn't been able to make the transition and be globally better, or a place like Helsinki, which I had to put the ice flows in there, because it's, this, was a, this was July in Helsinki, by the way. Uh, actually, I've been in Helsinki in July, and it's a beautiful place. Uh, but a place that really has, you look at a company like Nokia, they used to make rubber boots, uh, and, and now they're obviously a global high-tech leader. So what is Europe's future? Is it, is it the Finland path, or the Scandinavian path that's been able to deal with high wages, high standards of living, high social benefits, and still be globally competitive and innovative, or is it more the Italy path? I think becoming Boston or Helsinki for both America and Europe, I would say three things. One, I think we need to form, and we've said this before, a much stronger transatlantic partnership because both our regions really respect markets, we respect globalization, we want market-based trade, and yet there are many countries in the world who don't buy into that vision and are systemically violating it. When we work together as two regions, we have a lot more leverage on what we would call innovation mercantilism than when we just stand alone. So I think we've got to work more collaboratively on these issues, fighting intellectual property theft, fighting forced technology transfer, fighting standards manipulation, and the other types of abuses that go around around the world. Uh, for Europe, uh, I, I'm not going to tell everything on Europe, but to me the main challenge for Europe is if you want uh, innovation, you have to want, you have to be able to accept innovation. In other words, you have to be able to accept the creative destruction part of innovation. And I think Europe's challenge is it wants the high-tech innovation without any, without any of the disruption. I think for America it's a little bit different. I think our problem is that we've been number one for so long, we just think that it's our inherent God-given right to be number one. Uh, we're not really in competition, according to Paul Krugman, so we don't have to do anything. Um, so I think really what our challenge is to recognize this is an incredibly complex and competitive world. There's a whole slew of countries all around the world who are making the investments, figuring out their tax code, doing all of these things to become competitive regions for companies, uh, both global companies and domestic companies, we need to recognize that and develop and implement a national, uh, an aggressive national innovation <coughs> and competitiveness strategy. So thank you. With that, uh, I'm going to turn it over now to our panelists, uh, Maria, if, and if you would go first. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob, uh, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. What I thought I would do is uh, okay, um, talk, about, talk a little bit about uh, the measures Finland has taken during the couple of uh, last years and then give some concrete examples um, of those measures which, measures, which hopefully give an idea uh, of the recent developments. Um, the background uh, for all of this, uh, I would say that uh, Finland uh, was doing well in, in 
international comparisons of competitiveness a couple of years ago. And the factors we thought were behind those good rankings were factors like high quality educational system, continuous investments in R&D, both public and private, and then uh, well-functioning networks of institutions. But uh, some, some years ago, this trend uh, uh, doing well started to decline, and even if the governments for the last couple of decades have uh, continuously implemented uh, innovation policy, there was a feeling that uh, we needed a new strategy. And uh, the, the factors that made this change in innovation strategy are, uh, were not unique for Finland. Things like globalization, sustainable development, accelerating technology development, and finally aging population. Um, Finland is among the countries that uh, where the structure of population is is uh, forcing us to to find solutions that increase productivity and efficiency. So the response to these challenges uh, was to come up with a new national innovation strategy. 2007, the government that time got a task to. Uh, draw up a new innovation strategy and uh, it took there was a steering group hundreds of experts were involved and the process took more than one year but they came up with a report and then on the basis of that report the government gave uh, its policy paper on innovation to the parliament which then for its part approved the recommendations just very in broad terms what the what the national, the new national innovation strategy was, there were like four basic strategic choices that were made. First of all, innovation in a world without borders. I mean, obviously, Finland's success depends on the ability to connect and position itself in global knowledge and value networks. And uh, the idea is to try to determine in which areas Finland would add value and uh, become a country in which it is worth investing in order to be, be part of that knowledge. Then secondly, demand and user orientation. It was felt that uh, the traditional approach of fo focusing on the development of new, new technologies doesn't guarantee competitive strength. And instead, the key to competitiveness is to, to be able to identify needs of customers, citizens, and then develop solutions for, for those needs. Thirdly, innovative individuals and communities. Basically, the idea is to, to in, uh, encourage individuals there be active in, in, in innovating and, and also uh, uh, make it easier to these individuals and, and institutions to get together and, and cooperate. And finally, then, Systemic approach, main, meaning that innovation policy must be broad-based and comprehensive. Uh, that uh, strategy is now there's a is being implemented, and there's a, last August there was a uh, innovation policy paper by the Ministry of uh, uh, Employment and the Economy, and basically it just builds on on those four strategic. Choices, but I don't, I don't, I'm not going to go into those because it would take too much time. Um, I just mentioned a couple of examples of concrete things that have been done. Um, one is a uh, so called FinNode. Uh, FinNode innovation centers uh, have been created in five countries China, the US, Russia, Japan, and India. And, and the idea is to bring relevant actors together and uh, work working together and the, uh, in a new way and that that um, way to improve coordination and cooperation and uh, he, for example here in DC the Finnode US uh, head is is based in the I mean in the embassy location and and embassies we are involved in the in their work trying to cooperate and and that way I mean pooling resources together one other example is Alta University. <coughs> Uh, which is a merger of three universities in Finland, in Helsinki, 
and it was done as part of the larger educational reform a couple of years ago and there are three universities uh, which were kind of emerged Helsinki School of Economics, Helsinki University of Technology and University of Art and Design and the idea is to again it's it's sometimes called as an innovation university to bring all these various sectors together and um, and uh, encourage innovation. Um, then um, uh, I would mention uh, uh, one TEGES program called Young Innovative Companies, TEGES the uh, Technology and Innovation Center, uh, Finnish Funding Agency for Technology and Innovation. Uh, they have a pro program called Young Innovation Companies and uh, um, Traditionally, uh, venture capital has has been kind of, I, I don't know if I should say problem, but we haven't done so well in that. So I was really pleased to see that we were number two in the report. But the, the, the guest program offers a chance for domestic and foreign investors to choose companies which they want to finance. And then now more than half of the financing of the companies that are part of the program comes from foreign investors, which is very good. And uh, probably all of you know Angry Birds, and uh, that's uh, something that has really uh, <coughs> created confidence in Finland, that if also small companies, individuals can create um, smart business concepts that, have, that can be globally uh, used. Um, and finally, I would just say that in the future, Finland's success uh, uh, depends on how successful the EU will be in its economic and innovation policy. And that's why in the national strategy it is um, uh, stressed that Finland has to be very active in the development, of direct, uh, development and the directing of the EU's innovation and research policy. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Kent. Thank you, Rob, and thank you for uh, for having me up. This is the careful timer, you see. There's nothing is left for chance at uh, ITI. Uh, and I did have some prepared remarks that I'll put those aside. Well, congratulations, Rob and Mike, for another very effective collaboration. Uh, they're just. I want to start by several emphasizing several very positive features that I find in this study. The, it starts with the fact that you combine a snapshot in a sense with a movie, that you're not content to say we're ahead right now, but this is a long race and we're not getting faster as fast as we need to. I really like that you were very explicit about your metrics and how you developed them and how you weighted them. So if someone said, well, gee, I kind of think that venture capital is not as important, they could redo the weights and get a sense themselves. But also by looking at this, you really emphasize that innovation is a complicated system. It's not just people in a white coat in a laboratory. It's looking at how those ideas are developed, how they spread, how they're financed. Uh, a complicated, uh, I think, as you mentioned, looking at the users, what kind of role do customers play in demanding new products and demanding a kind of excellence. And I think the, uh, I also like the way you, you carefully looked at each of these measures that you have and tried to give the, uh, the reader not an exhaustive but an insightful look at what you meant by corporate R&D and why was it important or government R&D and so forth. And there are a couple other elements that you stress which are often omitted from reports like this. One is your emphasis on the, uh, the limitations of thinking only in neoclassical economic terms. Now, Rob, as you probably know, has made an enormous contribution by focusing on what he calls innovation economics or a competitiveness strategy, where you're really asking how does a an advanced country grow over time? What kind of investments do they need? What kind of system? What kind of institutions? And that emphasis is, I think, really important. And although you've done a lot of that elsewhere, I think it might be useful to expand in the, in the 
the uh, Atlantic uh, Century Part Three expand a little bit more on what you mean by the limitations of the neoclassical approach. And what is what would an innovation economics really look like? And uh, I think, uh, having made the mistake of being trained as an economist, which is, as you know, one of the two most reviled professions in Washington, I uh, have come to think of it as a, a complicated toolkit. And there's times when you want to use the insights of neoclassical economics, or you want to use the insights of Keynesian economics. But you really have to add this, let's say, Schumpeterian perspective, and it's one that's been sort of honored, uh, but often pursued uh, only in the breach. And then I, I wanted to, uh, just to make a, a couple points that uh, you've gotten into. One is this question of innovation mercantilism. And of course, you point to uh, a number of economies often located in East and Southeast Asia that have a very uh, focused uh, attention, very focused strategy on becoming innovative powers. And often that has involved everything from currency manipulation to a good deal of borrowing uh, intellectual property without uh, honoring the payments. So I think that uh, you see a potential combination and alliance between the uh, European powers and the North American powers in sort of resisting this particular approach. But I think you need to spell out a little more this tension between having an effective innovation strategy ourselves and this question of innovation mercantilism. Uh, if you think of the strategic trade theory where the first mover really has an enormous advantage and may benefit by underpricing the initial product and yet that really pays off in the long term in terms of building an effective industry. Or the other problem, and I think this is something we all need to think about, let's say that there is, in fact, a transatlantic partnership, much as, the, as you know, the Obama administration is working on developing a, a trade template for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Let's say there is such a partnership, but it just doesn't carry the day. What do we do then? Are we, if we can't beat them, do we join them? And if we join them, what does that suggest uh, for policy? I... Uh, I thought uh, just a couple comments on uh, the tertiary degrees. And this is one of the, the joys of this report is that it's so detailed that you then want to ask for more detail, which is almost very unfair. But getting into education as an example, where I think you reported that Germany has only 58% of the US level of tertiary degrees. Yet in passing noted, of course, they have a different approach to technical education. So a lot of that might substitute for community college or even four-year degrees. But at some time, at a point, we probably have to weigh uh, which degrees do we want to emphasize the most. Are we focused on STEM degrees? Uh, that's probably too narrow. I thought the Finnish example was very far-sighted in terms of adding design as an element of competitiveness, which certainly is something that we focused on at the, the Council on Competitiveness. Uh, I had a couple of questions, too, about government R&D, where in the U.S. in particular, we put a great deal of government R&D into the national security arena. Uh, some of that clearly has had an enormous payoff in terms of long-term growth and competitiveness, but not clear that all of it does. So we might want to at least think about reweighting that to distinguish between investment uh, in R&D that's likely to have a, a broader impact than that that is maybe more weapons uh, specific. And in terms of measuring FDI, I think, again, we might want to parse what kind of FDI do we want to welcome. There's currently a great debate going on about should we be wide open and welcome Chinese investment. I think certainly if any of us were advising China, we would urge them to diversify out of dollar-denominated assets and into the, the kind of uh, raw materials and technology assets that they're seeking. But perhaps this FDI is different, let's say, than the Japanese FDI of a decade or earlier, which brought quite a, an innovative process, technology with it, and some other more of uh, those intangible kinds of assets. Uh, of course, I was a little sensitive about this uh, impact of the aging society, uh, although I've become quite a fan of Jack Benny myself as I've gotten more into that aging society. And I, I think it would be interesting to 
look and see how other countries are adapting to that. And finally, I would just say that one of the things that we need to do as a country is to realize that it's not all invented here. That might have been true in 1960. It really wasn't even true then. But it's much less true now. And this is a global enterprise, as Maria pointed out. And we need to be very effective in looking at, at, at China, at Brazil, at Germany, at Finland, and see what best practices and what innovations they're developing and how we might learn from those. Well, let me close then again with a congratulations, Mike and Rob, a terrific uh, and very important report. Thank you, Kent. Money. Okay, I'll, I'll be uh, relatively brief. I want to make um, three points. Uh, the first one is I, I want to compliment Rob and ITIF on once again uh, setting a standard for what it means to have high quality work. And in classic ITIF fashion, I think this report has both terrific, clear facts. It doesn't take the orthodoxies as true and challenges conventional wisdom. And it just doesn't leave us with a sense of despair. It talks about what can we do about that. And I think that's an extraordinarily important message to be had because the core thing that I take away from this work, as I did to the one before, and what I think the core challenges of the US is one of complacency. Um, we should stop turning to the rest of the world and saying, it's because of you that we've got a challenge. My friend Steve Clemens at the Atlantic and New America says, when is Gulliver just going to realize that the problem is we have to untangle ourselves? And so this report is, I think, a, a, a useful reinforcement of the necessity of competitiveness and innovation in the U.S. that is up to us to figure out what to do about that. I, I take the challenges of, of Europe as well, but I want to focus on, on the U.S. on my remarks. Um, I think that's important because in the 1970s, the U.S. grew uh, largely by population and by the workforce growth. 70% of the growth of the U.S. economy in the 1970s is because we were living off of the combination of the baby boom and women entering the workforce. By the 1990s, 80% of the GDP growth in the U.S. was because of productivity. If we want to sustain the GDP growth that we've had over the last 20 years in the U.S., it's going to have to be 90 plus percent productivity growth. And if we want that to be productivity growth that is actually job creating, not just because of efficiency, the way we're going to have to do that is we're going to have to innovate our way out of this. That's really essential for job growth. Uh, just a couple of factoids. In, since the downturn, the rate of new business startup in this country has declined by 30%. That's four or five times what it did decline in the last recessions. If it's not the only measure of innovation, but continuing to grow and scale business is an important element. If they just, if we just kept the rate of growth that we had in the last downturn, we'd have two million people more employed today. Uh, we are in a, a new era of jobless recoveries and without ensuring that we have innovation and competitiveness of the U.S., we're in real trouble. Even if we had the fastest job growth that we did in the United States since the post-war time in the 1990s of a couple hundred thousand a month. It's going to take five more years to get back to the level of employment we had at the beginning of the downturn and 10 plus years to get to reasonably full employment. That's something that we just can't sit back and hope it gets better or rely on the rest of the world to grow as obvious. So that's my first first comment. The second comment, I was, I was really intrigued in this report. It's the first time I've seen it highlighted this way around the look at the state level of the comparisons. I um, mean, I think it's really interesting for, for a couple of reasons. One is, um, in the past, the U.S. relied a lot in terms of its innovation and employment growth by having people move to where the jobs were. Uh, up until uh, five years ago, the one in five people moved in this country every year. That's now down to uh, one in 10. The movement has declined in half. That's partly because of aging. When people are, are uh, younger, they move. It's also partly, obviously, because of uh, housing lock. People with underwater mortgages aren't exactly going to get up and move. And it's also because of health care lock. We have, if your spouse is employed, even if you're unemployed, if you've got health insurance for your spouse, you're not exactly going to pick up and move. So it's important that we don't just rely on let's picking up and having people move to create new jobs. We actually have to have place-based innovation. And one of the exciting things that this report showed me is consistent with some other data seen in other sectors that there is as much variation within the U.S. as there is between the U.S. and other countries. 
And so that's encouraging because what we have to do is really look at what's working and scale it across this country as well as looking at what others are doing and learn from that. Um, it turns out whether you look at innovation, productivity, healthcare outcomes, educational performance, there is enormous variation across this country and we need to, to figure out what's working and make that commonplace, not, not the exception. <coughs> Unfortunately, in a lot of the sectors that are the most problematic for the country, it's not just that simple. If we had government competition, Singapore would be ruling the world right now, but we, that doesn't work. So we really have to have a, a, a challenge and say, how do we ensure that when we know what works, that becomes the, be the common practice, not just the best practice. And the last thing I'd like to leave you with is a couple of thoughts of where I might look for innovation in particular places where I think if we're going to work our way through this, that these comparisons, if we look at them in two more years, I'd like to see some real progress as opposed to saying, well, only Italy's behind us. It'd be nice to see actually some real trajectory. And my, my basic belief is that we're operating in a dual speed economy in this country right now. U.S. particularly globally competitive companies are performing extraordinarily well. They're, they are productive, they're innovative, they're growing, they're going to where new markets are, but they're not creating employment in this country. And part of that is because we've got four big anchors holding back the U.S. economy, each of which, in our estimation, is the scale of a stimulus package or a negative permanent anchor on the economy. And that is our public education system, their, the cost of the achievement gap in the United States relative to other countries in the world or even with relative to other, the best in the U.S. is the cost annually to the U.S. of between five and $800 billion a year. We can't compete if we've got a large portion of the workforce that's not trained for where the jobs are going to be. Secondly, we need really to have a productivity revolution in health care. The U.S.'s health care cost relative to the other OECD countries is four to $500 billion or more a year and growing in relative terms. Finally, we, third, we have an infrastructure, both most importantly physical infrastructure, but relatedly, as I said, in our intellectual infrastructure that is under invested in and is gonna need uh, both a reinvestment and a, a revolution in terms of how we pay and perform. And lastly, the public sector as a whole outside of those major sectors is gonna have to come up to terms with the fact that we're gonna have to have a productivity revolution in government and the public sector that has, has been going on in the last two decades in the private sector. In fact, while it's hard to estimate, our rough guess is that, it's hard to say precisely, our rough estimates are that if the U.S. public sector had kept pace with the private sector innovation and productivity in the last two decades, we would not have a deficit right now. The difference between growing at one or two percent a year in productivity and borrowing one or two percent a year over the decade or two is an enormous difference and we have to have to focus on that. So my, my concluding thought is that it's absolutely essential that the U.S. not be complacent. This report, I hope, helps reinforce that while we're making progress, we need to accelerate that. And while uh, Rob uh, is uh, bashful about it, the uh, innovation and competitiveness strategy is absolutely crucial for, for this country. It's not the same thing as an industrial policy, but it's much better than saying what we really need uh, what we can do is just hope for the best. We really need to address the things that this report highlights. Okay, thank you, uh, Lenny, and, and all, all four of you. Those are great comments. I appreciate it. And um, we have about a little less than half an hour, so I'd like to open it up to comments and questions from you all. If you want to um, make a comment or question, just raise your hand, identify who you are, and if there's a, to a particular person. So start back there, Ken. Ken Jarbo, Athena Alliance. Um, Lenny, I just came from another meeting with, the, with Steve Clements of moderating actually that uh, and used the Gulliver analogy. But every one of the CEOs on his panel, when you talked about Gulliver being tied down, it was all being tied down by taxes and government regulations, none of which were the four big things that you just mentioned. And Rob, I think in the, in the index you have um, ease of startup as one of the indicators. Have you looked at any other indicators of regulatory barriers? And to what extent are we really being tied down by regulation, which is the hot topic in this town right now, versus other factors? Well, I can start and then Lenny can jump in. Um, 
The, that actually, that indicator of ease to do a business is more than just starting a business. It's uh, a wide variety of metrics that the World Bank has, and there's a citation in there. So, look, I, you know, I think our problem is uh, this, how do we develop a consensus around a national innovation and competitive strategy is actually probably harder than getting the debt ceiling higher. So one of the things that we wrote recently was a thing called one from column A, one from column B, why we need a national competitive entity. The point was, there are lots of really important insights that, if you will, conservatives or Republicans have about these issues, as, and there are also very important insights that Democrats or, or, or left to center have. We have to have better public investment in a lot of these areas or else we're not going to do well, but it is clear that our uh, our corporate tax rate is too high at the effective level as well as the statutory level. It's clear that in some areas, regulation is holding back innovation. I think we can see that to some extent in healthcare, uh, with bio, with pharmaceuticals, with medical devices, with other things. Now, the problem is that we get into these bifurcated debates where it's kind of just you know just get government out of the way and everything will be fine. I mean that's just that's that's just obviously I in our view nonsense. Government has a key role to play in many of these areas. Uh, but at the same time, if we don't recognize that there are key issues there where government is in the way, we're not going to get there either. So what I'm hopeful is that we can get beyond this kind of ideological posturing and get to, I mean, this is what, I, what is so impressive to me about Finland. I was going to ask, maybe I'll ask it after Lane. how do you do this? I mean, when we hear these delegates, we're always, our first question is, how do you do this? Because uh, we can't do it, you know. And other countries seem to be able to build the political consensus around this. So maybe Lenny, if you can go first, and then Mari, maybe you can just give us some insights from Finland. Uh, so when we talked about what the necessity is for job growth uh, in this country, one of the most important elements is, in fact, that regulatory issue. We'd call it speed. It's not necessarily the level of regulation. It's the uncertainty and duplication of it. One of the things that we're intrigued by is the doing business report that you highlighted at the that's a global comparator. Um, we should be thinking about the equivalent of that at the state and local level in the U.S. because there are huge overlaps of regulation and challenges that are duplications at the federal, state, and local level and multi-jurisdictions within local that make the time to get something done, the certainty of that and the risk of it, it actually is holding back things. So aside from the ideological debates around too much, too little government, get that out of our way, one thing that we should be able to have a bipartisan agreement around is let's actually have the regulations that we have work and actually thinking through a lean process where reducing time, increasing certainty, making it clear that when you start, here's how you're going to get out and what's going to happen. I think that that could be a, a big addition to trying to encourage investment in certainty and help create jobs in this country. Great. Mario, did you want to just comment on sort of this political question in Finland? I, I, it seems to me you don't have the same level of uh, conflict or disagreement that we have? Uh, well, like I said uh, briefly in, in my introductory remarks, uh, during the last two decades, uh, all the governments, I mean, governments normally stay four years, and one after each other, they have uh, kind of consistently have had a focus on innovation policy and uh, it's not seen as something I would say political and, and of course our system also differs in the sense that we have more parties and at the moment we have six parties in the government so it's 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 not it's not maybe so much going from one from one like extreme to the other but it's it's more you know I would say consensus Try building consensus and and then continue uh, continue from where the previous government left. Sure. Although you do have big arguments over there about uh, issues like immigration policy, which are quite divisive. But in this area, there seems to be more of a consensus across all the parties that this is in the interest of Finland. Uh, yes. My name is Eve Copeland, and I'm here from the U.S. Israel Science and Technology Foundation. I just had a quick question about methodology. How did you choose the countries that you included in your report? Um, partly it was related to we didn't want to have too many countries just for sort of presentation uh, ease, and secondly it was related to some difficulties of getting data on particular countries. 
Uh, I'd certainly be happy to talk with you at some point about Israel data. There was some problem on getting some Israel data. Uh, but obviously Israel has, uh, um, you know, real strengths in certain areas, venture capital being one government R&D. But um, we wanted to be able to get countries that we could get pretty good data on. So we certainly could talk more if you'd like. Uh, in the back here and then here. Hi. Um, thanks for having this panel. It's quite uh, excellent, actually. I wanted to talk a little bit about the two things. One, the president's, I'm pronouncing Dennis from the Global Trade Guard. I want to talk about the president's uh, innovation bank that just proposed where certain funds could go into a bank where we could uh, have uh, venture capital money match uh, government uh, sector money to actually spur more um, technology transfer to the marketplace. And the other thing I wanted to talk about is the government competitiveness uh, drop that you uh, pointed out. We have a myriad of programs throughout the government in innovation. I can think of one, the SBIR program. We spend about $6 billion a year in the SBIR program. The reports show that about 80% of the money goes to the same researchers year after year. There's no money for technology transfer and commercialization in the SBIR. When you get to pay phase three of the SBIR, you have to find all private money. So then people fall into the valley of death. We have similar programs over at the Department of Agriculture. We have similar programs at NASA, even in the Defense Department. How do we really get a handle on helping government help us? Okay, you want to try that? Those two really uh, excellent questions. I think number one on the innovation bank, uh, this is uh, variations of this idea have been tried before, and some of them have been very effective. Uh, without it being a bank, you had the advanced technology program at the Department of Commerce. It was a double peer reviewed investment. You look at its technical merits and you look at its likelihood for commercial success. This uh, and many similar kind of efforts have run into the, the phrase that Larry brought, Lenny brought up, which was uh, industrial policy. And even though this looks an awful lot unlike industrial policy, it got tarred with that brush. And that's part of the change of thinking uh, that we have to go through to get back to a more pragmatic American tradition. In terms of uh, how do we deal with all these different innovation programs, uh, there have been various efforts going back to uh, President H.W. Bush was something called Fix It, tried to look at a number of themes across the administration to see who was doing what, let's say, on high-speed computing. And uh, under President Clinton, there was a, a National uh, Science and Technology <coughs> Council, which again was meant to try to coordinate research across the government. But doing more of that and doing it more effectively would certainly be a, a welcome idea and I think it's the kind of thing that would also flow out of just what uh, Rob has been suggesting that once you decide you need what Lenny and Rob and all of us have been talking about an innovation competitiveness strategy then you start looking at all these programs in a slightly different way uh, and I think that change in mentality which is much harder as Rob says than raising, raising the uh, debt ceiling is what will drive greater coherence and coordination and one thing, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to look at our, we have a, um, a blog, Innovation Policy Blog, which Lenny is a contributor. I can't, you may be, I think, as well. I'm not sure. Should be. You should be. I'll stir myself. Be. Yeah. Anyway, there was a posting yesterday from Stephen Izell about the difference between industrial policy and innovation policy, which I commend you to look at, because I think that's one of the biggest confusions I think we have as a country. We, we think that picking batteries as a national priority through RPE's industrial policy, when really industrial policy would be to pick Duracell to create lithium batteries. Now that's industrial policy. Just simply saying that we think batteries are important to the country and having a wide variety of bets peer reviewed on a wide variety of technologies is innovation policy or technology policy. And I think we've got to get that right, and I don't think we, we do. So, uh, I think you had, yes, sir? Yeah, Bill um, Swift from Technology International Magazine. Um, we had a little reference back then to, there was some reference to defense budgets um, and defense as a share of national R&D and defense and NASA are a big share of national R&D. Um, I'd submit that really in the last few decades they've become 
very bogged down, very mercantilist, and uh, successively let, contributing successively less to um, private industry, um, and more and more um, divorced from the needs of commerce as a whole. Um, is there a sense that that is a, do you feel that that is a, another major drag on competitiveness? Um, have you looked at whether if the defense and space enterprises were to become less mercantilist, um, more um, uh, innovative, um, that, you know, would that turn from a drag into a benefit? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the number of major U.S. technology companies that can trace themselves back to defense or national security establishment funding, it's really pretty striking. There's an enormous impact that that spillovers have had. Um, now, one of the challenges, though, is that there's a nice study by the Business Roundtable recently by a number of CFOs who are concerned about the financial pressures in the private sector to force companies to make short-term decisions at the expense of long-term investments. So this is the private sector acknowledging that. I think what we've seen in the U.S. government is exactly that same dynamic. We now have a lot of defense funding. For example, you can look at DARPA, and I think make a very strong case, as our colleague Erica Fuchs at Carnegie Mellon has made, that DARPA has moved up the development chain and what it funds. It used to fund stuff much earlier in the development chain that had much bigger spillovers and benefits to the U.S. economy, and we always talk about GPS. But now what DARPA has done is they have they feel that they have to solve real problems tomorrow in the battlefield. They've moved up that chain. Now, I understand why DARPA does that, uh, but the result is that the impact, the beneficial impact of those kinds of federal supports on the U.S. innovation system are less than they would be maybe a decade or two ago. So I agree with you 100%. One of the interesting things, by the way, is when you look at the DOD budget uh, on research, which is 6.1, which is basic, 6.2, which is applied, and 6.3, which is development, it's done the exact same thing that the corporate has done. In the U.S., the corporate share at, at, on, in basic and applied, if you will, 6.1, 6.2, has shrunk while development has gone up. Uh, and I understand why companies do that again, but that's why I think we've got to, as, as, as I think, did Keynes say this? Lean against the wind? And one Federal Reserve Bank guy said we've got to lean against the wind of that direction. Chesney Barton, I think. Who was it? Chesney Barton, I think. Yeah, it could have been. Uh, we've got to do the same thing in our government programs. Is we've got to get them to be back closer to really more shared technology. So, I don't know, Lenny, you were taking your head. You, I don't know if you want to add anything or... No, I think you got this. Okay. Other uh, questions or comments? Bob. Hey, Rob, I got to ask Bob Wall from the AFL CIO Industrial Union Council. I I'm just curious and important, and great report, by the way, really, really informative. Um, the productivity <coughs> statistics you used. So, how, did you, how do you square that with the, what we know is this problem in productivity measurement in the U.S.? Well, <clears throat> I think. I mean, the problem with all of this stuff is you sort of have to rely on these countries that, including us, that in theory are doing the right kinds of measurements, that in theory are comparable across borders. You know, that's a huge, huge problem. I think there are problems with all the data because of that, but you do the best you can. I think what you may be alluding to is the fact that I think there's increasingly uh, good evidence we've written about it, a lot of other people have written about that, U.S. manufacturing productivity statistics are significantly overstated uh, because of significant mismeasurement of output, on, and particularly in a couple of different industries. When we look at the sort of what we would say more accurate manufacturing productivity numbers, what it shows is that mm, not all, but certainly much of the job loss in manufacturing is due to the failure of U.S. manufacturing to increase its output at the same rate as the economy overall. So while the U.S. output went up 15% in the last decade, so GDP grew 15%, in our estimation, manufacturing output went down 10%. <clears throat> now, to go to Lenny's point about high growth or startups, I think that's the other. There's two things about the U.S. economy, why it's in the doldrums. We haven't had the startups, and then we've had these losses. So our estimate is 2 million manufacturing jobs would have been saved if we had had the same manufacturing output had, hadn't shrunk. And then you put a multiplier on that, and you get a lot more jobs out there. 
obviously this data, these data do not incorporate that because we're not going to go into our country and, and manipulate the data because that would be unfair and we'd have to do it. Other, but in a sense, these productivity numbers in the U.S. are probably slightly overstated, <coughs> if that answers your question. So we're probably doing slightly less, we're probably doing slightly worse on the productivity numbers uh, than what the uh, data here show. Okay. Yeah. The, the other part that I would state on that is that the largest portion of the U.S. economy, the largest sector, is one that we productivity is measured as outputs equal inputs, and that's the public sector. And so in a, the, there are challenges within the private sector, and, and in aggregate, that's much better, though, because it may be that it's not manufacturing productivity growth, but it's manufacturers who are redoing their supply chains, and it's gains from the, the service sector and business services and, and IT and Etc. that are helping drive that. But we don't measure public sector productivity in education very well. We don't measure it in healthcare very well. We don't measure it in the public sector as a whole. And if we did, we would conclude that that is a bigger drag on what's going on than the, the, all the sets of comparisons that we're making in terms of private sector comparisons. So there really does need to be a substantial effort in getting an honest assessment about how are we performing and what can we do about those things as well. Yeah, and that leads to a whole other area, which is, I mean, if you look at the BLS numbers, you'll see in the last decade, there's, there are many industries that have had negative productivity growth, which is striking when you think about it. They're producing less output per hour than they were a decade ago. And I think we need to really seriously understand what are those dynamics? Why is that happening? Is there a role for government, whether it's as a smart procurer or buyer or in regulation or technology development? I mean, one of the things we talked about is um, in a different report that we did on uh, hotel productivity and hotel innovation, believe it or not. It's a very interesting thing to get into the hotel industry and what they're doing. There's actually a hotel world leader in Finland. Um, Stephen, you remember the name? I don't remember the name. But it's a hotel in Finland that actually Tech has funded the research on this. And it's a hotel that is a almost completely personless hotel. You check in on your cell phone. Uh, you get a key thing, you go and you just put the key number in, you can, you can go in there without seeing, if you've got a problem, you can call somebody, but it's like a business class traveler hotel at like half the price, because it's so totally automated hotel. That's a Finnish innovation. That's a really cool, you know, you may not like it, but go pay full fare for Marriott, and I'm going to go to this hotel. Uh, but, you know, a cool innovation uh, to deal with a sector we don't think about much, uh, and there's, I, I would imagine there are going to be lots and lots of opportunities if we, if we think about it right. Mike, Can yeah. I just, um, yeah. There you go. There you go. I just wanted to make a <clears throat> one comment on business regulation uh, for global companies across borders and just give three very quick vignettes. Um, last week, one of the things we did at ABC is we took five members of the European Parliament to South Carolina because they usually come to Washington and they asked us if we could visit the United States instead, and so we said, okay, we'll try to arrange that. So we went down to see the governor, uh, Nikki Haley, and then we spent three hours at a Navistar plant in Columbia, South Carolina. I have uh, 800 people there. It used to be a Siemens plant. They build all the fuel injection systems for two, almost 300,000 diesel engines they make every year. This is the, the fuel in and, and the exhaust treatment. It's really the high value now of engines. And of course, what they were explaining to these members of the European Parliament is the, the emissions regulations in Europe are different than the United States, just like automobiles, and therefore they're wondering how they're going to enter the European market since they make a U.S. engine, if you will, and without getting any more detail, um, uh, that's the case. If you buy a Mercedes in Germany, you bring it to the United States to pay $3,000 to retrofit it. If you buy that same Mercedes here and, and ship it to Germany, it's another 3,000 euros. I mean, these sort of a lack of mutual recognition or harmonization really are just bad ideas for open markets and free trade. The second thing is I was in Toronto yesterday because we had then some members, different members of the European Parliament in Toronto uh, to visit our businesses up there. And one of the companies, it's a Canadian company, was explaining that they have the REACH Directive, which is a chemical directive, pretty famous, in Europe. And now the Congress in the United States is going to redo the TSCA Directive. And they're just this uh, poor Canadian company that says, gee, our two biggest markets are going to have uh, huge different regulatory regimes if we're not careful. And our parliament in Canada wants to have our own TSCA. And so what do we do? Uh, and 
they don't have an answer for it, but these are the sort of global regulatory disconnects that don't help anybody. Uh, and the final thing I'll say is Energy Star was kicked off in the Department of, uh, of Commerce and Energy back in the 90s when I was with Intel and I was at the kickoff uh, announcement over in the India Treaty Room, as I recall. And so since then, Energy Star is used in Canada, used in Japan, used in Europe. It's been a terrific global standard. Well, the US EPA in the United, United States here announced in January they're going to move from supplier's declaration to conformity on these products to third-party certification. And Europe is not going to go along, nor is Canada and Japan. And so after 12 years of success with a global standard, the U.S. is now going to add an additional regulatory step for all U.S. companies and people that import here. Well, this makes no sense at all, and uh, EPA should really re-examine this, and this is contrary to the Transatlantic Economic Council's mandate, which is to try to find harmonization. This was a success story that's now going to be broken up. So those are just three stories about trans-border regulatory problems that companies face in trying to export, especially small companies, into a foreign market, no matter which way. Sure. There's a lot, obviously many, many more examples that you could pick on that. Uh, privacy and cloud computing being, being exactly. another one right, right now. Uh, I think health IT, smart grid are going to be other areas once those markets develop. And, you know, I, I always say to my 19-year-old son, and I, I'm probably wrong, say, uh, whenever I go on a trip to Europe, I have to bring a different outlet size. And I say, David, you know, this is sort of one of the most bizarre things in the world. You know, they developed outlets and we developed outlets and they were just because we weren't connected. We'll never have a technology again as long as we exist that is not a global standard. You'll, you'll use your internet in any country in the world. I don't know if I'm all that positive about that anymore. I mean, we could have different smart grid standards uh, around the world now. Different e-vehicles. Different e-vehicles, different, different health IT standards. I mean, we have this huge opportunity to create global, vast global markets if we get the standards part right, and it's a huge... Uh, I'll have to give my son a large amount of money if I'm wrong, and I don't want to talk about it. Yes, sir. Yonayama from Mitsui and Company, Japanese multinational. Um, aging society. <laughs> um, baby boomers are growing and the uh, center of gravity for consumption is shifting to uh, um, senior people, especially in Japan. Uh, how do you connect uh, innovation uh, orientation or target versus demography? Especially Europe is also uh, uh, aging and uh, Finland you said uh, um, demand-based uh, innovation. But the demand may be shifting toward the uh, Asian society to some extent. How do you recognize the demand? Um, I mean, I have one thought. I mean, Mike, you've been doing some stuff on that. I mean, I, I think I'm going to answer your question slightly differently. I think, and this is, you're not really allowed to say this for another couple of years till just in fact, but I think the big challenge over the next 20 years for Europe and, and Japan and America is, is, is productivity growth. Uh, and, and because we, you know, just in the next 14 years, we're going to move from 63% uh, of the U.S. population who are workers to 57% uh, versus dependents, young and old people. Uh, there's no way to keep our standard of living up unless the people who are left, who are working, are producing a lot more. And the only way to do that is through productivity. So I know, I know you, you're not supposed to talk about productivity now because we obviously have a jobs problem, although all the evidence shows high productivity leads to more jobs, not less. I still think, I think that is, that's the big challenge for aging societies, is to drive high productivity growth. Uh, but there are also obviously big opportunities around innovation for just the elderly population. I know Intel at one time was doing a lot of work in the, I know you might be not at Intel anymore, but Intel had a whole group that was working on t advanced technologies for aging people. Like for example, uh, a special smart carpet, so if you fell, uh, in which older people sometimes do, this would notify uh, our next of kin or relatives or doctors or things like that. So there's all sorts of really interesting, and the Japanese have been doing that too with, you know, uh, robotics, uh, big robotics push in Japan to have them start to care for some of the elderly, particularly in home so that elderly can stay in the home longer. So I think there's lots of opportunities like that. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the home health care uh, issue, if you will, there's a trade association called Continua, dot org, I believe, uh, and they're focused on using ICT for home health care and monitoring of aging. But on the specifically on the gentleman's question, um, in the United States, for every uh, 300 people, we have one doctor. If you live in Indonesia, for every one doctor, there's almost 7,000 people. 
sickness. So where would you rather be sick? One of the things we have to change, I believe, is to stop thinking that you work until you're 60 or 62 or 65, and then it's a binary deal. Then you stop working and you golf in Florida until you're 90, like my father, uh, who's been golfing for 30 years on Social Security so far, and his 90th birthday party is this weekend. Um, we have to find ways to have mutual recognition of professional degrees. So if I'm a doctor in Florida, can I be recognized to practice in Indonesia? So if I want to get up in the morning and I'm a radiologist and I can read x-rays uh, on my computer that have been taken in Africa, let's say, in Namibia or someplace, and then I can analyze those x-rays, email to that clinic uh, my uh, review of what's happened in those x-rays and then I can go off in the afternoon but I can have an income I can contribute to health care and those are digital exports so there's a huge um, area of opportunity for the West to have lifelong contributing part-time full-time and to have digital exports of countries that need our skills so instead of just retiring we have semi-retirement where we use the technology but we also can enjoy some some leisure as well I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Chris Bledowski from Manufacturers Alliance. Um, two comments. One is that intellectual property, I think, is closely correlated with how innovative the societies are. And I, while I don't know the um, methodology that, well, this is the first time that I'm here, uh, the inclusion of either the enforcement of the intellectual property rights uh, uh, something about counterfeiting, things like that might be, um, might improve or give a little bit more robustness to, uh, to your index. We have just run uh, a survey among 75 big uh, industrial companies in the United States, and about half a dozen business uh, councils that we run, and it's quite amazing how pervasive uh, counterfeiting is uh, and what kind of problem that is. Without going into details, that's just one one thought. The other thought is, um, when I was looking at your data, uh, the, comparing the statics with the dynamics, the statics being, you know, what the situation is at a, get, at a given point of time, the U.S. obviously was near the top, and most of the industrial countries were near the top. When we switched into the dynamics, the first six, seven countries were mostly the developing countries, where, you know, the more you invest in all those six or seven parameters that you show, the more you equip every worker with more capital or infrastructure, the higher the catch-up, which is kind of obvious. So I think that the point of reference is to look what kind of progress the U.S. is making, but not so much to those less developed countries, which is obvious that they would be making greater progress, but to the peers, you know, to the Finlands or the EU-15, uh, EU-25, and, and some of the other uh, countries where we truly could benchmark. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. That, the issue of catch-up came with the uh, the last report. I actually share an interesting anecdote with that last report, because we presented that really all throughout the country in many different forums. And the only place I ever, we ever, ever got pushback, now maybe it's because the only, the only sophisticated people are in Washington, but I really, I'm not going to, I don't think that's the right explanatory hypothesis for what I'm about to say, was the only place we ever got pushback was in Washington. It was interesting. It was like, you can't measure countries on per capita. We do more R&D than the Finns, so we're better than the Finns, even though they do more per GDP. So I thought it was an interesting point. But one of that point came up, which was, you know, isn't all this catch up? And reality is, sure, there's a, there, there are some of those countries who you would just expect to be making greater progress than we are. But there are also some of those countries you would not expect to be making greater progress, you expect to be making the same amount of progress, Japan being a good example. Um, Finland, some of these other countries. So, sure, I mean, I would have been, if, if we were sort of 23rd in progress out of all those countries, or 19th or something, I'd be like, okay, yeah. But the fact that we're dead last, and now we're second to dead last, that to me told me something more than, it was more than just about this catch-up phenomenon. With regard to your other point about IP, <clears throat> I mean, this report really is not a measure, <coughs> by and large, of policy um, it's really more of a measure of, of sort of structural factors and conditions. So I think it would have been hard to measure sort of piracy. I would actually argue, we have a report that we did last fall called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of Innovation Policy that my colleague Stephen Nizel took the lead on. And I encourage you to look at that because one of the factors is it looks at 
a uh, number of different factors around innovation, mercantilism, what we call it. And IP is one of those. And there's a big debate about IP theft and forced IP transfer and unwillingness to pay for software and all that. Is that harmful to China, to use that case, or is it beneficial to China? Uh, I think the dominant wisdom in Washington is that that's harmful to China, that it's hurting their innovation system. And I'm actually off to China in a few days to talk about that. I actually think it's probably uh, still beneficial to China. Uh, I think they benefit from that. Now, at some point, they'll get up this innovation ladder where they have more innovators than they have stealers or copiers, uh, at which point they'll switch. But I think for at least another 10 years, getting your technology for free, it's kind of like, why do you want to go on iTunes when you can steal it on, 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 uh, on, on, on a you know, peer-to-peer network, other than you happen to be ethical? Uh, I think paying for stuff is hard. So I, I guess I would argue that the Chinese can be quite innovative, that, that, that intellectual property theft and counterfeiting, et cetera, is a way to be innovative. You, do, you can jump up that ladder very, very quickly and gain capabilities that your enterprises wouldn't get if you had to go through the long, laborious process that most other countries have done, which is learning. This is sort of rapid learning, only it's illegal rapid learning. So I just, I would say, I think that, uh, anyway, I, I don't know that sort of IP protection is equated to high levels of innovation. I think in advanced countries it generally is that you want to, I mean, I think that's the right policy for us is to, and it's the right policy for the world. But I think there are individual countries that can gain, on, gain, gain the system that way. Any last comments from any of the, the four uh, commenters, panelists? I mean, I, I would just reinforce once again what your concluding comment was, Rob, that we have a lot of debate right now appropriately on getting our fiscal house in order and ensuring that we are living within our means, and that's absolutely crucial. But over the intermediate term, the only way we actually do not have that problem again is to grow our way out of it. And that's why really having a competitiveness innovation strategy is so essential in aligning our country around the fact that that actually is the, the facts that you're talking about today are the reality, and we could wish that we were not going to have to worry about this, but we really do. Okay. Just like to, again, emphasize your message about how hard it is to get people to change the way they think, and that really, I, I think, is the single most, in, uh, single largest impediment to us moving forward on an innovation and competitiveness strategy. Uh, I'm going to take Mr. Greenspan as an example, a really clearly enormously accomplished man. He was very careful to look at detailed series with regard to productivity growth. He was early to identify it. As a result, you could have a non-inflationary but more accommodating monetary policy, added billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of, of output. At the same time, his view that the market would always self-regulate clearly led him astray. And we need to move away from that 30 years idea that all the magic is in the marketplace. There's magic in public policy, there's magic in public-private partnerships, and we need to get back to an American pragmatism which says, let's see what works and how do we solve this set of problems. Probably just uh, add uh, one thought that uh, it's linked to the, your, your question earlier, how we, how we managed to do it. Uh, um, I think, uh, like in many other areas, if if there's a if there's a need for a new strategy or a new policy, traditionally in Finland there, there's a, an expert group set up. Like in this case, there was a steering group, and uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of experts, and they produce a report, and then it's then it's an expert report which is kind of discussed in political in the government in the parliament, but. It's, it's seen as an expert report, and, and probably that helps as well. And secondly, I think the innovation, this is, there are other issues uh, which are more divisive politically, but definitely this, this area is seen as crucial for, for the success of Finnish economy in the future. Yeah, I, I just add one quick thing about Finland, which to me, which is so, so fascinating, given what's happening right now in, in Washington, which is, if you go back and you look at Finnish history, you look at 91, 92, I believe, when the Soviet Union was breaking up, the Finnish economy declined three times more than our economy declined in GDP and jobs. I mean, they were in deep 
deep trouble with a huge fiscal <laughs> crisis. And what they did was not have this debate about the debt ceiling. What they actually did was three things. They lowered their effective corporate tax rate to become more competitive in the midst of a huge financial crisis. They expanded their support for technology and innovation in programs like Techus, and then they cut other kinds of spending that they could, couldn't really afford. You know, so here's a country that was in much worse shape than we did, and they made all the right decisions, and it paid off for them. And to me, if they can do it, it seems to me we ought to be able to do it. We're only 20 times bigger and more complicated. But, uh, Mike, any last comments? Uh, well, thank you, Rob. Um, well, I'll just make the comment that um, capital is a coward, and that if you do uh, things like have a health care bill that's 2,100 pages, and no matter what you think about it, it's very complicated because all employers are affected. If you have a new consumer protection agency that's uh, been a huge battle and nobody knows that what that means for companies large and small, if you have the highest corporate tax rate in the world and, and if you have um, uh, a policy that if you make more than $250,000, we're, we're focused on you. Uh, we called the NFIB the other day, EABC did, and found that the average small business owner makes about two hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year so if we're looking at new firm creation and a person has to decide if they're going to have a second dry cleaner or a new restaurant or a new technology company a software company and and the more they expand the more they they're at risk so all of these things large and small these big factors and small factors we need to be business friendly if you if you like job creation you better like job creator finally i'll just thank rob and scott and your team for another Excellent report, and we're delighted to be your partner. Appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you to all you all, and please join me. Thank you.